1,3-dimethylxanthane. 1,3-dimethylxanthane. That doesn't sound like something you would want in your body. What did you have for breakfast? Oh, 1,3-dimethylxanthane. <laughs> Over pancakes, scrambled eggs. Well, I had it in my body. I had it in my body. You see, a while ago, when I was younger, I was in graduate school, and I needed some money. So what do you do when you need money? You're a young man in graduate school? You enroll in a clinical trial. <laughs> That's what I did. And they put a catheter in my arm, and they put this 1,3-dimethylxanthane into my veins. Yeah. I, didn't, I had no idea what 1,3-dimethylxanthane was. But they did tell me what they were trying to do was figure out how long it would stay in my body. So that's what we did. We sat around, and we waited for this stuff to get out of my body. Now, what I didn't tell you, though, was that 1,3-dimethylxanthane is a cousin, biochemically, to caffeine, a thousand times more potent than caffeine. So I got this injection on a Friday afternoon at around 2 o'clock. I went to bed Tuesday morning at 4. <laughs> it's because of the caffeine. So now we know how long 1,3-dimethylxanthane will stay in at least one body. Well, that was a clinical trial that used many subjects, just like me, to understand the biochemistry of this particular medication. And we didn't know what it was, but we did know that we had to find out what this answer was. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is how we can collectively help cure disease. Now, if I told you that the cure to cancer was in your body, would you give it to me? Would you give it to your grandma? Would you give it to your granddad? Would you give it to somebody you didn't like or didn't know, didn't care about, that didn't give you pancakes? Would you give it to them? <laughs> I would. If I had the cure to cancer in my body, I'd give it to everybody. That's what this talk is about. Crowdsourcing the cures. The cures to cancer and many other diseases. So we're going to talk about clinical trials today. And the first thing I'd like to tell you is that we've done clinical trials before. We have a lot of information that we got from clinical trials, and here's some of it. So moderate alcohol consumption, Turns out it's good for your heart. Who knew? <laughs> Clinical trial told us that blood pressure increases, high blood pressure increases the risk of heart attacks and stroke. Clinical trials told us that. The increase of that healthy cholesterol that they call LHLD, that cholesterol, well, it reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease. Clinical trials told us this. And here's one that clinical trials, we probably didn't need a clinical trial for that, but it told us that smoking was bad for you. If you smoke, stop. If you don't smoke, don't start. Clinical trials told us that too. <laughs> and leafy green vegetables are good for your brain. Your brain loves that stuff. And the last one I'll tell you about is that exercise. We know exercise helps everything. It makes you thinner, it makes you more beautiful, it grows hair. <laughs> I tried, haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> All of this came from clinical trials. And this is probably your image of a clinical trial. But what if I told you that this was the image of a clinical trial, where you have patients, or what we call participants, subjects, working individually with their doctor, with the principal investigator of that clinical trial. We call them PIs. This is a more accurate vision of what clinical trials are. This is certainly what I experienced. And studies have shown that people in a clinical trial get the best care. They get care that's better than anyone else because they have a team of doctors and physicians and, and clinicians working with them. Well, I want to tell you about what clinical trials are and how they are put together. They are essentially put into three broad categories, and we call them phases. And each phase is designed to answer a specific question. So phase one, Ask this question, is it safe? Now, that's the scary part for most people. But let me tell you, before they can put anything in a human, it's already been gone through 
has gone through many preclinical tests to identify its safety profile. So this question really is, if it, is it as safe as we think it is? That's what this question is. So phase one answers this question. Is it as safe as we think it is? When that answer is yes, the next question is in phase two of the clinical trial, does it work? So we think it's gonna do this, we're gonna shut down this biochemical pathway which will starve the tumor of nutrients it needs and the tumor will die. Does it really do that? Stage two helps us do that. Then the last one is phase three. Is it better than what we're using already? That's what phase three does. And when they do phase one trials, they use a few people. They use phase two trials, they use more people. And then phase three trials are masses of people. That's where you and I come in. Phase three trials. Is it better than what we're using already? Well, you have these three phases. Phase one, is it safer than what we think it is? Phase two, does it work better than what we have? And phase three, is it better than what we have? Now, you might think that doctors can do this research all by themselves. Just hang out their shingle, put on a white coat, and go to town. But it's a little different than that. It's a little different from that. They have some regulatory controls that are put on them. And it comes in the form of the Institutional Review Board. Every phase of a clinical trial has to have the management of an Institutional Review Board to make sure they have one goal, and that's to make sure that patients are protected. That's the only goal of the Institutional Review Board. Now, you may think that it's just a bunch of doctors who are kind of chummy with each other and they're taking care of each other. You've approved my trial, I'll approve yours. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. The Institutional Review Board is made up of individuals just like you and me, patient advocates. Sure, there are doctors there, but there are patient advocates. Sometimes there are patients on these Institutional Review, review Boards. And everyone in this room can qualify to sit on an Institutional Review Board. One of the things that they take care of is this integrity of the research to make sure that all of the different components that leads into patient safety is maintained in the, control, in the trial. So this is how they do that. First, they have the informed consent. The informed consent simply means that anyone considering enrolling in a clinical trial, they must be educated about every potential problem with that trial everything that's going on in that trial, everything that's gonna to happen to them, for them, and because of them has to be in that consent form. And people just like you review that consent form and say, yeah, this meets our standards. Everyone in a clinical trial gets the standard of care. Because remember, they're comparing, is it better than what we have already? So if you eat broccoli to cure the cold and you're in a clinical trial, guess what? They're gonna feed you broccoli too, along with what they think is gonna cure the common cold. That's the standard of care, and everybody gets that. There's also a risk-benefit analysis, and that's where you take into account the risk of being in a clinical trial because, yes, there are some unknowns against the benefit of being in that clinical trial, and you have to weigh that. So clinical trial is a part of the continuum of discovery. Once we find a drug that works in the laboratory, we need to test that thing in people. First with a few, then a little more, and then a little more. I say that the answer to this cancer problem is in this room, in somebody's body, in all of our bodies. But we need to be part of the clinical trial so that they can find it. One of the other things with the clinical trial is to make sure that everybody has the role to participate. If you can want to participate, you should be able to, so that we don't have clinical trials that look like this. One type of person in the whole trial. Well, people are different. I'll give you an example. When I get a headache, I take acetaminophen. When my wife gets a headache, she takes ibuprofen. Ibuprofen does nothing for my headache, but it works great for her. We are different in that way. So if we're different in that way, imagine how different we are when it comes to cancer therapy. Some of the most complex diseases on the planet, we could be very different, and we may never know if we don't participate in clinical trials. Remember that 1,3-dimethylxanthine? thing? This is what came from the study I was in, the dose. The dose must be individualized on the basis of serum concentration measurements 
in order to achieve a dose that will provide the maximum potential benefit with minimal risk of adverse events. What that really means is the dose is not a one size fits all. That you have to check this thing to make sure it's the right dose for the right person. And now I can tell you what 1,3-dimethylxanthine is. You don't put it on your pancakes. You breathe it. It is an asthma medication for kids, a pediatric asthma medication. And now they know that the dose is not a one-size-fit-all for every child. I helped them find that. So when that single parent is laboring over her child who's scratching out and laboring trying to get that next breath of sweet oxygen that we all love, and they're trying to get it, they give their child 1,3-dimethylxanthine. I like to think in nights that there's somebody that's maybe a single parent who says, this is a miracle drug. I have to find out what this drug is. They go to their medicine cabinet, and they take this drug, and they read it. They read the label, and what they see is not going to be my name. It's going to be 1,3-dimethylxanthine. The dose must be individualized. That's my claim to fame, because I was in a clinical trial. Before I go, there's one thing I want to do. I want to take issue with the term that we use. When someone dies from cancer, we often say that they lost their battle with cancer. The people I know who had cancer went to work. They started educating people so that no one else would have to suffer with a disease like they did. They go to work to make sure that there's funding for research. They go out there and start talking about clinical trials and the benefits of participating. In my view, that's not losing the battle. Thanks to some of the people I've known who've gone on, millions of people understand the risk of breast cancer. And those are just the ones that I know. That's not losing the battle. In my mind, they're passing the torch. They pass the torch to me. And they pass the torch to you. And they're gone now. And the only way that we can thank them, the only way that we can move progress forward is to participate in the clinical trial continuum. Maybe being a, a patient is not for you, but being on the institutional review board could be. So the next time someone asks you what you want on your pancakes, tell them. 1,3-dimethylxanthine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.